The story revolves around the Lamore family, which consisted of the parents Josiah and Sarah, and their four children, Herman Montgomery, who was 11, Murray Catherine, who was 10, Arthur Boyd, who was 7, and Paul Vernon, who was 5. Way back in 1912, on the 9th of June, the Moore family were spending their evening attending a children's day programme at the local church, which was organised by the mother, Sarah. The Moore children are brought two of their friends along to the children's day, the Stillinger sisters, Ina May, who was 8, and Lena Gertrude Stillinger, who was 12. Earlier that day, Murray Catherine had invited the Stillinger sisters to spend the night at the Moore house, and they accepted. So Mr Moore rang the parents of the Stillinger sisters to ask if they could spend the night, but the parents were out. So it was Ina and Lena's older sister Blanche who answered the phone and she gave the okay for her sisters to stay and she would pass a message on to her parents. This was probably a decision that would haunt her for the rest of her days. The event started at 8pm and ended at 9.30pm. The Moore family along with the Stillinger sisters arrived home at some time between 9.45pm and 10pm and settled down for the night. The next morning at around 5am, Murray Peckham, the Moore's neighbour, was out in the garden hanging laundry. And by 7am, she noticed that the Moors had not yet woken up to start their chores, and she thought that the house seemed particularly quiet, as by this time the family were normally awake and going about their business. When 8am arrived and there was still no sign of the Moors, Murray Peckham decided to investigate. She went over to the Moors' house and knocked on the door, but there was no response. So she tried to open the door but it was locked from the inside. At a loss what to do next, she decided to let out the Moore's chickens before ringing Josiah Moore's brother, Ross Moore, to come and check on the family. When the brother arrived, he first of all tried to peer through the windows, and when that failed, he produced a key to the front door which led him into the parlour. The house was in total darkness, and apparently it smelled of death. As he stepped inside, he went directly to the doorway of the first room which was just off the parlour, whilst Mrs Peckham stayed on the porch. The brother then extended his arm and pushed open the door and let it swing open, and what he saw would haunt him for the rest of his life. In the room, lying upon a bloodstained bed, were the dead bodies of the Stillinger sisters. Immediately, Ross Moore rushed back out of the house, onto the porch, and told Mrs Peckham to call the local sheriff. Once the Marshal Hank Horton arrived, he searched the house and discovered not only the bodies of the Stillinger sisters, but the bodies of the Moore family. Every single person inside the house had been brutally murdered by some axe-wielding maniac as they slept. Their faces had all been totally caved in and were unrecognisable. It's believed that the night before, as the Moore family returned home at around 10pm, they had showed the Stillinger sisters to their room for the night, which was situated downstairs off the parlour the room that Ross Moore entered and discovered the bodies. After the Stillinger sisters were settled for the night, then the rest of the Moore family retired to their rooms and fell asleep. At some point in the night, an unknown person entered the house, or maybe he was already inside the house hiding. This is thought to be the case because of two small cigarettes that were found in the attic. Another strange detail was that there was no signs of forced entry, which also suggests that the killer was already in the house. Either that, or he simply let himself in through an unlocked door. And back in those days, an unlocked door was not uncommon. People were a lot more trustworthy. But I tend to side with the theory that the killer was already in the house. I think this is backed up as well by the killer actually locking up after himself when he left the house. The intruder then obtained Josiah Moore's own axe and an oil lamp which had the chimney removed and the wick was altered to make the flame smaller. The killer then proceeded directly to the parents' bedroom, possibly passing the Stillinger sisters' bedroom on his way up the stairs. As the intruder crept very quietly into the mole's bedroom, he went over to the bedside and held the hack's eye above his head and brought it down multiple times upon Josiah's skull. Over and over, Josiah received more blows to the face than anyone in the house, totally destroying all recognisable features of his face, reducing everything to pulpy flesh and bone matter. The extent of the damage to his face was so severe that not even his eyes remained. And then the killer did the same to Sarah. At times catching and gouging holes in the bedroom ceiling with the axe which may have suggested he was in a frenzy. Now with the parents out of the way he ventured into each of the children's rooms. Herman, Murray, Catherine, Arthur and Paul were next. They were bludgeoned in the head the same way as the parents. 
When he had finished with the more children, he then went on to the downstairs bedroom where Ina and Lena lay in their beds. It's believed that as he bludgeoned Ina, Lena woke up and tried in vain to fight back. This was believed to be the case because every person in the house were killed as they slept and were still in their covers. But it seemed that Lena had been killed out of her sheets as if she had tried to flee and fight back. But ultimately, she failed. It was reported that she was found in a very strange position with her nightdress hitched up over her waist. Although there was no evidence of rape, she may have been inappropriately touched due to the way that she was positioned and the discovery of a blood smear on the inside of her leg. And this was believed to have been made by the killer as he pulled her down the bed. Many believe after the killer had gone around killing all the occupants of the house, he then went round a second time to inflict more damage upon the already dead family. And this was believed because one of Sarah's boots were found knocked over under the bed and it was full of blood, which suggested that the blood had time to drip off the bed into the shoe before it was knocked over, which suggests that the killer had revisited each of the dead bodies and carried on hacking at their faces until all that was left was mashed up skull fragments and brain matter, which was all over the headboard and pillows. And upon his second visit, he kicked over the blood-filled shoe. All the victims, apart from Josiah, had been attacked with the blunt end of the axe. And for whatever reason, Josiah got the blade end of the axe. There were some other strange details found inside the house as well as the dead bodies. The killer had gone around the house and covered up what was left of the victims' faces with bed sheets. Also, every curtain was drawn apart from one or two windows that didn't have curtains. It was on these windows that the killer simply covered them up with clothing. He also went around the house covering up all the mirrors before making himself at home and making himself a snack. There was also a pan of bloodied water that was left on the kitchen table next to the plate of uneaten food he had prepared for himself. It is believed that he used the water to clean his hands. It was also reported that Lena was found in a strange position, like I mentioned before, with a nightdress hitched up over her waist, and she wasn't wearing any underwear, and a coat covered her face. She lay with one leg kicked out of the bed, and with one arm shoved up under her pillow, with a defensive wound to the other arm, which suggested that she tried to fight back. Although there was no evidence of rape, she may have been molested due to the way she was positioned and the discovery of the blood smear on the inside of her knee, which was believed to have been made by the killer. And the only reason I bring this up again is because there was one more disgusting detail in that bedroom. The police found a slab of two pound of bacon wrapped up in a cloth or towel on the floor, which had been taken from the Moore's icebox. It's believed that the killer may have used the slab of bacon to masturbate with. Along with the bacon, the axe was also found in the Stillinger sisters' room and an attempt had been made to wipe it clean. The killer then left the chimney-less lamp at the top of the stairway and left the house locking up behind him. Now, after word of mouth spread about the killings, people started to make their way to the house to see what was going on and the police quickly lost control of the crime scene as literally nearly a hundred curious onlookers traipsed through the house, seriously contaminating the crime scene. It was only a local druggist who had the great idea to take pictures to try and capture some evidence and clues, but he was promptly thrown out of the house. But when it comes down to it, back in those days DNA testing was not even a thing and fingerprinting was in its early days, so it is hard to say that if under different circumstances the murders could have been solved. To me this bears many resemblances to the Lizzie Borden case where many people did actually trip through the house before they even attempted to make it a crime scene and try and preserve some of the evidence. It just seems to me that back in those days the police were just totally unequipped and unexperienced to deal with cases such as this. And the public who had some kind of morbid sick curiosity with the murders were allowed to just traipse through the house. It was even said that one member of the public took a fragment of Josiah's skull as some kind of morbid keepsake. Another thing I find shocking about this case is that many people knew that the Stillinger sisters were dead before the actual mother found out. Apparently, she rang the operator and asked to be connected to the house, and the operator responded, everyone in that house is dead. I can only imagine the horrors that that poor woman felt when the operator told her that. 
So, although the killer was never brought to justice, there were a few suspects. First, we have the Reverend George Kelly, who had quite a disturbing past. The Reverend was actually at the Children's Day event helping to run it with the Moore family. He had arrived in town the day before and left town on the 10th of June between 5 and 5.50 a.m., only a few hours after the massacre was discovered. Apparently, in his past, he had suffered a mental breakdown and had been caught peeping on different occasions, as well as asking young girls and women to pose nude for him. Apparently, in the weeks that followed, he became obsessed with the murders and started writing letters, quite a few letters, asking for details of the murders and even claiming that he may have witnessed the murders himself. Although, it was known that his mental health was questionable at best, and all suspicion that he may have been responsible for the murders was simply pushed to one side. That being said, years later in 1914, he was arrested for sexually harassing a woman who had applied for a job to be a secretary, and he had been arrested for sending her obscene letters through the mail. Fast forward a little to 1917, and he was arrested and interrogated by the police and actually confessed to the axe murder, saying that God made him do it, but later recanted his confession Apparently, the confession was a forced confession by the police who were apparently using intimidation and threats to get the confession. A bruise upon his cheek may have backed up this theory, and ultimately, the jury did not buy that this man could have committed the murders, and he was freed. And then we have Frank Jones, an Iowa State Senator. Josiah worked for Frank at his implement shop, but one day Josiah decided to go it alone and started his own company, as well as taking a John Deary contract with him. This apparently caused a feud between the two. On top of all this, it is rumoured that Josiah was having an affair with Frank's daughter-in-law. It was thought that Frank had hired a man called William Mansfield to commit the murders. Two other axe murders had been committed almost a year before in Colorado and two other axe murders that occurred in Kansas just before the murder of the Moore family. It was these two cases that Kansas police suspected Mansfield of committing, suggesting he was a drug fueled serial killer. Each of these crime scenes all had similar details, especially the Colorado crime scene. The windows and the dead were all covered up by sheets or clothing. There was a bowl of water left that had been used by the killer to clean himself up, and a chimney-less oil lamp was left at the foot of the bed, just like the Moore murders. As well, there were even more axe murders that had been said to have occurred along the South Pacific Railroad from 1911 to 1912. And it was in 1912 that the Velisca Axe murders happened, which would fit it quite nicely into this time frame. Another interesting detail is that even though the introduction of looking for fingerprints was new at the time, Mansfield actually had his fingerprints on file for other crimes that he committed. And Mansfield knew about this. But no fingerprints were found at the crime scene, suggesting that the killer wore gloves, because the killer knew that his fingerprints were on file. But if there was one thing in particular that would place him as suspect number one, it was because of the murder of his own family in 1914, two years after the Moore murders, which included his own wife, infant child and mother and father-in-law, and they were all killed with an axe. In 1916, Mansfield was arrested and a trial was underway, but it was all for nothing, as Mansfield had alibis for the murders and there was just not enough evidence and he was released and it is believed that Frank Jones, the Iowa Senator, may have helped with this. Another suspect, Henry Lee Moore, was convicted of the murder of his mother and grandmother months after the Moore family murders, and he carried out the murders with an axe. He was also a suspect of other axe murders and the Valeska axe murders, and he did serve 36 years in prison, but only for the murder of his mother and grandmother. As well as all these suspects, there was also talk of a serial killer who liked to travel the railroads, and murder people as they slept in very similar manner as a Moore family, slain with a blunt side of the axe with bedsheets covering the face of the victims, as well as all the other traits, the bowl of water, the lamp and covering the windows. And it is because of this that many hobos became suspects including a man named Andrew Sawyer. According to Thomas Dyer, a bridge foreman and pile driver for the railroad, Andrew Sawyer had turned up on the morning of the murders asking for work looking quite dishevelled. He wore a brown suit with mud-covered shoes and wet trousers up to the knees. His presentation was somewhat lacking, but Dyer needed an extra man and decided to take him on. Apparently, Andrew Sawyer was somewhat strange and seemed very interested in the axe murders which had reached the newspapers the day after, 
and become very paranoid that he had become a suspect as he was new to the area. Dyer's men also show concern that Andrew Sawyer liked to sleep fully clothed clutching his axe. Slightly worried about his interest in the axe murders, the foreman informed the police who arrested Andrew Sawyer but eventually let him go when he provided an alibi. This case will now probably never be solved. We can only speculate who the killer or killers were, just like the Lizzie Borden case. People will have their own theories. But unfortunately, the murder of the Moore family and the Stillinger sisters will remain another unsolved mystery. Way back in 1875, on the 4th of October in Pembroke, New Hampshire, 17-year-old Josie Langmaid, a girl described to be well-liked, pretty and intelligent, was preparing for her morning walk to school from her family farm where she lived with her mother, father and younger brother. Josie would normally walk to school with her younger brother Waldo, but he had already left and gone ahead of her on this particular day. This was because Josie was actually planning to meet up with one of her friends, a Miss Fowler, on the way to school and they would walk the remainder of the way together. Josie set off for school that morning a little late, between 8.30 and 8.45am, and she set off alone. Josie's journey to school was a two and a half mile walk via dirt paths of the woods that stood between her home and Pembroke Academy. Josie had taken this walk to school on many occasions, but unfortunately on this particular day, Josie wouldn't make it to school. Before the day was done, Josie's parents learned that their 17 year old daughter had not arrived at school that morning. The younger brother Waldo had arrived home and explained that she left after him and he hadn't seen her at school all day. He simply presumed that she had stayed at home. Word spread fast between the towns of Pembroke and Suncook and it wasn't long before a search party was formed with at least a hundred men. The first and obvious location to search for Josie was the woods, where she would take a two and a half mile trip to school every single day. After a few inquiries it was discovered that Josie had last been seen when passing the Hartford house and she was about half a mile from school. As the sun began to set, the search party lit their torches to light the way through the dark woodland and the thick undergrowth. At around 9pm that night, part of the search party found Josie Langmaid in an isolated area of the woods just off Academy Road. The area she was found was named Gail Swamp, and unfortunately, they did not find her alive and well. The flickering light from the torches illuminated Josie's blood-soaked torn dress that partially covered her naked body and as they drew nearer they could see that she had been badly mutilated and decapitated and her lifeless body had been discarded in the damp moss and her head was nowhere to be seen. The search party at once alerted Josie's father and of course they advised that it may be for the best if he didn't lay eyes upon his daughter's body. But this was his little girl and he was her father and all fathers feel a responsibility to their children to keep them safe from harm. How could he not run to his little girl? When he arrived at the scene, I can only imagine, as a father myself, the pure devastation the sight of his poor daughter must have had on his heart and soul. The men quickly made a stretcher and lifted the 17-year-old's remains onto it and carried it to a horse and cart that was close by. It was then taken back to the Langmaid family home where Josie's headless body was placed on her very own bed and there she stayed overnight. The very next day, under the light of the sun, the search continued and they were successful in finding Josie's head, about a half a mile away from where her body was found. The head had been wrapped up in her very own oilcloth cape that she had been wearing that morning as she left for school, and on a nearby road they found a three foot long broken wooden club that was soaked in blood. Once Josie's body was on the autopsy table, further disturbing details were revealed, details that explained exactly what had happened to the poor girl. And I will warn you right now, this isn't going to be pleasant to listen to. She had been brutally raped and severely beaten with the club around her head. Her throat was cut, but the killer didn't stop there. He kept going until her head came clean away from her body. It was also believed that Josie was alive when her head was being severed. There was also a cut to Josie's face and there was also an imprint from the killer's boot heel where the killer had pressed hard and dug in with his boot with such force it had left the print upon the girl's right cheek. It's believed that the killer held her head down with his boot as he cut her head away from her body. She had also suffered broken bones in her hand and possibly in a strange attempt to cover up the rape he had inflicted on the poor girl, he took his blade and sliced away the girl's private parts. 
As you can imagine, when the news broke out of the murder of Josie Langmaid, the community was outraged and everybody was out to find the murderer. But this resulted in a lot of wrongful accusations being flung about. This included the arrest of many tramps from around the area of Pembroke and Suncook and trained hopping vagrants. This also included the arrest of the only black man in the town of Suncook, but it is safe to say that he was only a suspect purely because of the colour of his skin. So even though arrests were being made, none of them really stuck. It was clear to see that none of them had committed murder. This includes a man named William Drew who lived out in the woods with his wife in a shack. But why was he a suspect? Well, apparently he was a little strange and liked to make inappropriate remarks to young women and on top of this, Josie's school teacher and Miss Lake claimed that Josie told her that William Drew had insulted her. So Josie threatened him by telling him that she would tell her father. And apparently William Drew threatened her by saying that he would kill her and cut her up into pieces. So as you can imagine, it wasn't looking good for William Drew, who was now suspect number one. And so it wasn't long before a lynch mob was formed to find William Drew, who would be better off in police custody than in the hands of this mob. But word of mouth had gotten around and William Drew knew that the police were after him and so he went on the run. Luckily for him, he was found by the police who arrested him on the spot and was taken into custody and they kept him safe from the mob in jail. Although it didn't stop the mob from forming outside of the jail building where Drew was being kept. In fact, the officers had to threaten the lynch mob and warn them that if they tried to take Drew, they would be shot dead on the spot. But after all of this commotion, it would seem that Drew actually had an alibi. On the day of the murder, Drew had actually taken his elderly mother to the doctors. Also, Drew only owned one pair of boots that actually belonged to his wife, and the boots did not match the print that was left on Josie's cheek. Also, the statement that had been given by the teacher about William Drew threatening Josie just didn't hold up, and it was believed that she may have fabricated the whole story due to a personal vendetta between the two of them. Things were once again looking hopeless. It would seem that the murder had simply well, gotten away with murder, but at some point in the investigation, a detective on the case had finally received a lead that may actually be promising. A gentleman came forward named Charles Fowler. He was the father of Josie's friend who she had arranged to meet that morning. Charles told the detectives that he had recently hired a Frenchman named Joseph LePage. Apparently, LePage had taken an unhealthy shine to his daughter and liked to ask all sorts of questions about the teenager, and it was clear to see that he'd become infatuated by her. And it was Mr. Fowler's son who informed him that the strange employee would often ask about his sister, asking what school she attended and what route she would take to school. The son clearly thought nothing of this at the time and showed LePage the routes his sister took to school through the woods. And apparently on the morning Josie was murdered, LePage had been seen heading in the same direction, holding a club longer than three foot in length, very similar to the club found with the body. This was definitely a lead the police wanted to follow, but unfortunately the strange Frenchman had skipped town and so their lead went cold. However, a year earlier, a school teacher named Miss Ball had been murdered in a very similar way in St Albans, Vermont. And of course, newspapers that reported of the murder of Josie Langmaid had of course reached St Albans. And one of these newspapers had made its way into the hands of the town selectman and he could see certain similarities between the murder of the teacher and the murder of Josie Langmaid. He knew that these two crimes may be connected. At once, he recognised the name. Joseph LePage once lived in his town, at the same time the teacher was murdered, and he had been a serious suspect in the case against the murdered teacher, but it could never be proven. And he also knew Joseph LePage's current address, which was in the town of Suncook, with his wife and children. He quickly informed the selectman of Suncook, who just so happened to be Mr. Fowler, the same Mr. Fowler whose daughter had planned to meet Josie that day, and the same Mr. Fowler who employed LePage to work on his farm. The St. Albans selectman gave him all the information he knew, and the police paid a visit to Suncook to the home of Mr. LePage, and Mr. Fowler also went with them. When LePage answered the door, Fowler at once identified him as a man who he had employed on his farm. Whilst the police were searching the house, they found bloodstained clothing, bloodstained straight razors and a bloodstained knife and also a pair of boots that matched the imprint on the girl's right cheek. 
And once the general public knew that LePage was now suspect number one, lots of people also came forward providing statements that they had seen LePage on many occasions harassing young girls. Even a mother and daughter told how they were once cornered in a secluded area by LePage, who was holding a club, and they only escaped because a random gentleman was passing at the time and saved them from what they believed could have been their death. Even more damning was a statement given by the sister of LePage's wife who actually came forward claiming that she was raped by LePage in a cow pasture after he threatened her with a club and apparently he was wearing a mask that she pulled from his face. What's interesting about this is the mask was found at the crime scene of the murdered teacher. But was this a man who killed Josie? Well, it would seem that it absolutely was and the evidence that stacked up against him was undeniable and it also become clear that she wasn't his first victim. As for the murder of the school teacher Miss Ball, well LePage was actually a strong suspect in that murder case like I said before, but his sons had given him an airtight alibi. But with all the evidence now pointing towards LePage and the murder of Josie, his sons actually recanted their statements, and it would seem that there was a high possibility that he did actually murder the teacher. LePage was found guilty and sentenced to death. Over the years, he repeatedly denied the murder, claiming he spent the morning roaming the woods lost, but LePage would eventually own up to the murder when he was on death row, just before his execution, possibly out of fear of what awaited him on the other side. He also owned up to the murder of the young school teacher who had been killed in a very familiar fashion. He claimed that she pulled off his makeshift mask revealing his identity, and he had no choice but to kill her. She tried to fight back, but it was all in vain. On the morning of the 4th of October, LePage had actually set out into the woods to meet and murder Mr. Fowler's daughter, who was waiting for Josie to meet her so they could walk to school together. But as we know, Josie was running late that morning, so the Fowler girl decided to set off without her. Luckily, a neighbour was passing by on horse and cart and offered the young girl a ride to school, and this definitely saved her life. Unfortunately, Josie Langmay came along the same route not long after, and realising that her friend had probably left for school without her, she carried on with her journey to school. At some point, she was attacked by LePage in a secluded area where he proceeded to beat her with the club, smashing her hand as she tried to defend herself. He then raped and mutilated her and dragged her body further into the woods and went even further with her decapitated head. LePage would then give directions leading the police to an area in the woods where he buried certain belongings of Josie's, which were an earring and a black ring. And this now made it 100% clear that LePage was the killer. Only he would know these details. LePage, who was now known as the French Monster, was executed on March the 16th, 1878. He was hung by the neck until dead. After the murder, Josie was laid to rest in Pembroke. She actually had an open casket so people could pay their respects. Her head had been reattached by sewing it back into place, and a delicate garland of flowers were made up to cover her neck and hide the stitches. Sadly, a few months later, Josie's loving brother Waldo, who had never gotten over the death of his sister and felt a great deal of guilt, unfortunately succumbed to typhoid followed by pneumonia and he died on December the 15th, 1875, and he was buried alongside Josie. Sometime later, a monument was erected in the memory of Josie Landmaid, which for some reason has morbid directions chiselled into the stone, directions to where her body was found and her head. And that monument is still there to this very day. When you think of Easter, what do you think of? I like to think of a day of happiness, a day of peace, Easter egg decorating, just festive family fun. In 1975 on Easter Sunday, all of which I just mentioned was taking place at the home of the Rupert family, 635 Minor Avenue in Hamilton, Ohio. Charity Rupert, the mother of the household, was in charge of cooking the meal that day. She had a house full of family members, 12 in total, including 8 grandchildren ranging from 4 to 17, and their oldest son and wife, who were mother and father to the children. Her younger son, James Rupert, slept upstairs recovering from a night on the drink. At around 4pm, James woke up from his drunken slumber, loaded a 357 Magnum and two 22 calibre handguns and a rifle. He then went downstairs and systematically killed everybody in the house. Not even the young children would survive. On today's episode, I will be covering the Rupert Family Easter Sunday Massacre of 1975. 
Before we go back to the actual murders, I think we need to go back to James's past, to his childhood, and try and understand what was going on in his troubled mind. Because as you may know, serial killers and murders, they always seem to have a connection to the crime, which stems from a point in their life, mainly from childhood, where maybe they were neglected or abused or something like that. Uh, first of all, the upbringing of James Rupert seemed to be questionable at best. Apparently, James Rupert's mother, Charity Rupert, constantly told James that she had never wanted to have a boy, and she often told him that she wished that he was born a girl. Now, his father, who escaped the murders due to passing away in 1947 when James was aged 12, he actually showed very little love or affection for the children, so it would seem that James had little or no love from his mother or father. After his father died, James's older brother Leonard became the man of the house and would constantly pick on James, taunting him and calling him a weakling and always putting him down at every chance he got. This resulted in James running away from home at the age of 16 and he also tried to hang himself with a sheet but he was unsuccessful and he returned home. So as you can see, he had quite a rough upbringing, an unloved upbringing. That is if we can believe his story that any of this is true, which we'll get back to a little bit later. Now, as 1975 came around, the year of the murder, James had matured into adulthood. James became very jealous of his brother, who now had a large family of his own and a marriage. James, on the other hand, had no job, no relationship, no children, and still lived at home with his mother. Now, in contrast, his older brother Leonard had a degree in electrical engineering, he had married James's ex-girlfriend, which must have been just another crippling hit on his state of mind. And Leonard also was a homeowner and had eight children. So as you can see, his brother Leonard seemed to be the successful one where life was going well. But James's life seemed to be standing still and he wasn't really going anywhere. He must have felt like the failure of the family. And on top of all that, James's mother was constantly threatening him with eviction from her home due to a lack of a job and drinking and owing his mother and brother uh, quite a big sum of money. So as you can imagine, he probably felt that he, he wasn't wanted. And it's probably worth mentioning at this point that people also outside of the family didn't really think much of him. Because you see, after the murders, quite a few people were questioned and a few of the people had described him as an helpful man, but unremarkable and quiet. I mean, what a thing to be described as unremarkable. Uh, so it would seem that not many people held him in such high esteem. In the weeks leading up to the fateful Easter Sunday, James seemed to slip even deeper into his dark depression and became distant and recoiled from social behaviour. A month before the murders, James started to inquire about silencers for weapons. And you see, at this time, James actually already owned the weapons and he already owned the ammunition, so it would seem that inquiring about his silencers, that maybe he was already planning the murders a few weeks beforehand. Maybe it was premeditated. Now, on his 41st birthday, which fell on the 29th of March, 1975, James was seen on the banks of the Great Miami River in Hamilton. And it would seem that he wanted to spend his entire birthday on the riverbank, shooting his 357 Magnum at tin cans, apparently getting in some target practice before the big day. The night before the murders, James had gone out to drink as usual, as he did every night. James drank at the 19th Hall Cocktail Lounge until 11pm, but did return later that night and stayed until closing time, which was 2.30am. And whilst he drank, he started to talk to one of the waitresses, a Wanda Bishop, a 28-year-old woman who worked at the bar. Now, Wanda recalled how troubled James seemed that night and down in the dumps. He made conversation about his mother, how she was always on his back, threatening him with eviction. He told Wanda how his mother would say, if you can afford to drink every night, then you can afford rent. And you know what? That's fair enough. I think his mother actually had a point with that. You know, why should she keep him under his roof if he's not going to pay rent? He's not going to provide any food or anything like that. But somehow he's got the money to go out and drink every night. I think his mother had a point. Then at 2.30am, James left the bar and headed home and slept off the booze until 4pm the following day. The day of the massacre. Easter Sunday arrived, and so did James's brother Leonard, and James's ex, Leonard's wife, with their eight children to spend the day with their grandmother. Whilst the Rupert family enjoyed their Easter Sunday together, Easter egg hunting, and other activities, James was upstairs, still sleeping off the booze from the night before. 
At some point, the family returned into the house. James's mother, his brother, and his brother's wife were all in the kitchen, and most of the children played in the living room. Upstairs, James woke from his drunken sleep. This was around 4pm. He then loaded his weapons, a 357 Magnum, two 22 caliber pistols, and a rifle. Probably round about 5 o'clock, James finally ventured downstairs with murder on his mind. The day he had probably been thinking about for some time had finally arrived, and James then entered the kitchen. Now at this point, I have heard different versions of the story. I've heard that James just went in and started blasting away, but I have also heard that he went in, he propped the shotgun up against the fridge, and started a conversation about a vehicle, and I believe that James became paranoid that he was being criticised about this vehicle, this, this conversation about a car, and that's when he picked up the weapons and started shooting, which unfortunately is the only certain conclusion that we can get from this. Now, apparently when he started firing, his brother was sat down at the kitchen table. He pointed his weapon at his brother and pulled the trigger, killing him. He then turned his gun onto his brother's wife, and I believe he shot her in the heart, and then he turned the gun onto his mother and killed her as well. He also killed his nephew, 11-year-old David, and his niece, 9-year-old Teresa, and his 13-year-old niece, Carol, right there in the kitchen, and I, b I believe the children were in the kitchen either helping with the meal. I have heard also that they could have been in the kitchen because they were waiting to go to the bathroom. James, who seemed committed and seemed to have no remorse or emotion about what he was doing, then walked into the front room to kill his remaining nieces and nephews. He then walked in and opened fire on Leonard Jr, who was only 17 years old. He then opened fire on Michelle, who was 16 years old, Thomas, who was 15 years old, Anne, who was 12 years old, and lastly, little John, who was only 4 years old. James had shot everyone in the house three times to ensure that they were dead, apart from one child, who he only shot the once. It is believed that he initially went through the house and shot everyone with one bullet first, and then went back and put the extra bullets into them. This is the way the police think it happened, because there wasn't much sign of a struggle. It would seem that everyone was taken by surprise, and it would also seem that no one tried to run away or dodge the bullets. In fact, the only signs of a struggle that the police could find was an overturned trash can in the kitchen. Apart from that, it would seem that no one really put up much of a struggle. It would seem that they were all basically taken by surprise. Apparently, it was all over within five minutes. The entire house lay dead. Three to four hours later, James would finally call the police and turn himself over. And at around 9.30pm, the police arrived. Upon the authorities entering the house, it was reported that around the bodies there was a hell of a lot of blood, and it was dripping through the floorboards into the basement, and apparently the blood that dripped through to the basement could still be seen for quite some time on the basement floor, and also on the wooden floor where the family laid dead upstairs, apparently the blood stains didn't come out of the wood. It was also reported that a total of 35 rounds had been shot, and all four weapons were recovered in the house. Now, when it finally came round to the trial, James pleaded insanity. Now, a lot of people believe his motives were simply money. You see, with his mother and brother dead, all of the family's net worth, which came to around 300,000, would then go to James. And if his plea of insanity was successful, then he would only serve a fraction of the time in prison, and the money would be simply waiting for him upon his release. Also, James had told the police officers who arrived at the scene of the crime, now this is, this is strange, he told the police officers that his mother drove him crazy by always combing his hair and always talking to him like a child, and apparently, according to James, his mother wanted to change him into a homosexual. Now, if you ask me, that's just a really strange thing to say to the police when they arrive. So maybe it was all to support his insanity plea, maybe he was playing up to it. Or his mother was actually that cruel from day one. I guess we'll never really, really know. You see, the only problem was that the neighbours, friends and so on all said that the Rupert family seemed like the salt of the earth, like a really nice family. Always polite and genuinely nice. James was eventually given a life sentence in prison and the house would go back up for sale. All the goods inside the house where the family were slain, furniture and such, were all auctioned off and then the house was cleaned up as best it could be, 
Unfortunately, like I said before, the bloodstains proved difficult to remove, so they were simply covered up with new carpets, and the house was then rented, but to a new family, who had absolutely no idea whatsoever what had gone on in the house. They had no idea about the massacre. I just find it disgusting that they weren't told about this before they moved in. I think now there's actually some kind of law where, like full disclosure where you have to tell people if something bad has actually happened in the house. And you have to remember at that time there was no internet, there was, there was nothing like that, so... It was probably easy to keep something like that under wraps, but of course eventually they did find out. Um, the family would not stay long and they fled the house not long after moving in. Apparently they were terrorised by ghostly voices and noises. The lights would flick on and off and doors would slam and footsteps could be heard running up and down the stairs on occasion. Now you could say that once the family found out about the murders, you could put all this down to the wild imagination just cooking all this up. I mean, you will hear what you want to hear if you want to believe your house is haunted. Nine times out of ten you probably will start hearing noises. But, that being said, it wasn't the only family to report strange noises and voices and an unnerving feeling in the house, and they also quickly left. And I believe that the house then remained empty for quite some time, until 2014, when a new family moved in, and the lady of the house says that she hasn't felt anything supernatural, no horrible feelings in the house, she's not heard any noises, and she absolutely loves the house and she says it just feels like home. So now, after 40 years, maybe the Rupert family finally get to rest in peace. Whilst James Rupert, who is still alive to this day, sits in his cell behind bars on a life sentence, James is set for a hearing which is set for April 2025, and when that day comes around, James will be 91 years old.